Frank Jean-Guy Roche. Hello, Jean-Guy. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. And so before we really start with the fire subject, could you just tell us in a few words what Air Carré is about? So Air Carré is, is about is an infrastructure company that I created 20 years, 22 years ago in Luxembourg. We are now in Luxembourg, Belgium and France. And we have grown in different sectors, non-finance sector, finance sector, cyber security. And uh, yes, with uh, always the pleasure uh, to do IT, to sell IT, to share IT. So we are, we can say that uh, we are uh, a company of geek uh, loving their, their job. Okay, great. But before, I mean, before you uh, reached what you have reached today, th there was some, uh, there was something else. I, you must have started it somewhere. You said a few years ago you started it, you created it, co-created it. But how did that come about? How did you get to be on your own, to start your company on your own? What made you uh, do it? So it's a story where I have to talk about myself, in fact. So I'm an industrial engineer in Belgium, uh, specialized in electricity. And then I started to make a master in environment. Uh, the mix between electricity and environment was superb at the end. Uh, but at the end, I had to, uh, to be uh, off for, for several months to get an official job. And I say, no, I don't want to do this. So I started to, uh, to send my CVs in Luxembourg, in Brussels also. And I received a, a proposal for an IT sector that I love, but uh, I never made any, any studies about IT infrastructure in my life. So I started there. I, I was working for a service company in Luxembourg near the Schober Fauer. Uh, and I really loved this environment. I started to work for ministries. I started to work for lots of people. And, and at this time, a uh, novel was, was there. So, uh, fantastic way of, of starting uh, networking between computers uh, where we had uh, the revolution where Windows 3.1 was arriving so that we were installing with floppy disks and everything. So uh, I started this there and then uh, I quickly moved to other positions and I saw that uh, on the markets there was a, a completely uh, lack between the, the different companies you had companies like Dimension Data, Telandus, which were already Capgemini, huge companies. And then you had a, a corner shop where you could uh, buy your, your white label computer, uh, where normally you had to buy your Microsoft license, but uh, sometimes it was not the case. So I found the fact that lots of companies were in Luxembourg were quite small, but wanted to have uh, a service, uh, appropriate service and appropriate you know, hardware. Uh, and this is the reason when I start and I say, okay, there is market there. So uh, I've tried on the market with one of my colleagues for six months. I searched my, my first 30 customers and then I launched Air Carry Company. As you explained a little bit, okay, I did that, and then I immediately launched myself. Oh, what was the trigger of launching uh, yourself? I wanted to be responsible of myself. I wanted to have the capacity to say no, even if I never said no to one customer. But only the fact to think that you can is a fantastic freedom. So uh, on my third uh, experience of work, I launched uh, a plant which was uh, creating CDs and DVDs at the time, Technicolor, uh, in food. And during this moment, I say, okay, uh, it, it was the time for me to think I must be, you know, not alone, but I must try and be in a focus where I can take my own decisions. And it was the click. And the second cling was the fact that I wanted to have. Uh, 
uh, fantastic communication and relationship with my customers. Uh, and this is something that I had not when I was working for a large company doing IT for IT. It was not the, the my dream. I wanted to have com I wanted to have communication with people. Okay. And on the other hand, I mean, you had uh, these were the triggers, but but how did you go about it? Uh, uh, because I mean, setting up yourself and getting some clients and so uh, and also defining the the right services they are looking for. Is that not something? Uh, how did you go about that? I would say that I, I've been helped by three, three, three sort of people. I had two of my colleagues. Uh, one has created the, the, the company on day one, Air Carré. Uh, he had already his, uh, his company, so he explained me how to do it. And the second helped me uh, to focus on trying, working with, for him and trying to keep my, my own business. This was the two people to know exactly what kind of work I could do with my customers and what kind of customers I had to search for. And the third, the third part, which really helped me uh, at the time, uh, was the Chambre du Commerce, where they really helped me, you know, focusing on, do you have the correct diploma to make your uh, access to the, the, what kind of status of uh, company, how will you create, uh, make the correct business plan with the, the correct numbers and so on and so on. Uh, yes, it was really important and I had the three people who can convince me that it was feasible and in fact that the fact that Luxembourg is a country where it's quite easy to launch a company and create it. That for that one, but how what, how did you go to get the first client, the first customer? Um, it's a, in French we say bouche à oreille, so the, the question is a, a little bit word about of mouth, word of mouth. reputation on the fact that when people were calling me, they were always calling me to the fact that they, they had an issue with their IT. And my first 700 customers, it took me seven years to get them. I had no sales. I only had reputation and the fact that on the market I was moving fast and trying to help my customers. And this is always in our, in, a, in our uh, DNA is even without cust without a contract, we continue to help customers and we continue to move fast because the fact that we are not more clever than our neighbors, we are moving faster. And th this is the one thing and how was it, uh, the, how did you find the revenue model which suits you? Because it's one hand if you're working as an employee for a company and you see how it is and eventually how things are bi uh, built with double L invoice. And on the other hand, if you are on your own and you need to have make ends meet, how what was the thing which made you select the revenue model uh, in the beginning, uh, in the beginning, how to invoice the clients? To be honest with you, I was really prudent. So I wanted to uh, just at the beginning, I wanted to earn my life and I uh, I wanted to. I was in a position where I didn't want any employee and I didn't want to sell any hardware. To be honest, today we are 150, well, 160 people and we are doing 25 million euros. So we have changed our mind. And this is also the question of fast reacting in front of the way you are servicing your customer and the way the customer reacts. So to answer your question, I started not so on, only selling the services, then I had to sell a full package. And then I saw that what wanted to have, people wanted to have proactivity also and not reactivity. So, and I changed, but it took me six or seven years to change the, 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 the model. And then after this model, I say, okay, it's complicated to get customers and I start to buy companies and, and to make external acquisition. So to answer your question, today after 22 years, we, have, we are on the seventh or the eighth model of, of vision of, of the way of, of earning money. And, and 
to be honest with you, the way we are doing business today is, is changing. For example, we can give the, the most, uh, the biggest impact of COVID today for us in our businesses is about telephony, unified communication. We see exactly, and we are pure definition. It's so easy to make a, a conf call video and so on. I've, I'm in the middle of nowhere with my computer, internet access, I make this. So the way people are working today in, with the unified communication, we had fixed phones, mobile phones, and visiophony. We see that it's changing. We see that all the, the wonderful work, like the wonderful brands like Siemens, Ericsson, Avaya, all these brands are disappearing. In, in three years and four years, we won't see any fixed phones on any, uh, uh, on any desk anymore. So what are we doing? Are we starting crying or are we changing our model? We are changing our model. Okay, that's interesting. And on the other hand, I mean, you are changing your model, the, the tools you can offer with whom you can work eventually, uh, and then hence also the services you offer, they adapt. But how is it with the clients? Because one thing is to have the tools and the services. The other thing is to have the client, the customer using it, using it and paying for it. Because very often, uh, I mean, we have this um, early adapter model, innovator, Steve Lemmer, and as you said, you evolved, but uh, are the clients, customers evolving with you? Or is it the other way around that they come to you and suggest a, a few services? I would say we have both uh, explanations to give you. One of my worst uh, thing I have ever done in terms of business unit is something that I'm, I'm so proud of is AirSign. AirSign is a is a tool that we created with Noina. It's a company specialized in digital signatures. We have created a wonderful website where you can do wonderful signatures uh, related to ADAS model where the European Commission created a, a model. We, we are completely inside this model and we see that it never worked because we are not in the digital flow. We are only at the end and at the end, if you need to take your, your sheet, scan it and put it into my, uh, my tool, you take your pen, sorry, you take your pen and you sign and it costs you nothing. So the digital signature is a fantastic tool when it's integrated in a flow, but alone, not. And I can promise you that I was so proud when we made this business unit, but it, it doesn't work. It starts working years after years, because we are in, now we have understood the fact that we are integrated in it. The second, uh, a second vice versa of question is about, you know, cyber security today. And, and you see that the cyber maturity of our customer is nearly zero. And it's, it's a fact that people don't understand the cyber security, but we see that we have created that secure and we can convince very easily a customer that he has to do something better of what he's doing today to be more cyber resilient. And honestly, I had no idea that it would take, that the, 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 the things would grow so much and so quickly uh, versus this problem. I was thinking it will cost money. It will get them the, the fact that they had a very small password. Now they have a password like this, MFA and all this kind of, solution they have procedures to change passwords and i would say it will never happen customer will, will refuse it but no they are not if you train it if you explain them correctly then they accept and they say okay my risk is too big i'm going to correct it so you see two two different things and two different views of you know being quite early adopter but something that you convince your customer very easily and another and I'm sure I'm never sure that I will be able one day to to convince my customers to use this platform.
So the, 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 the question is being, you know what you are doing and you do it well, but don't touch the other pillars of other people. We don't, we do infrastructure. We do cloud, we do communication, but we don't do software. And it's absolutely necessary. We should be always saying, mm, there, you will always have one customer saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you develop this or whatever? No, it's not my job. I'm not a specialist in this. What we do is we do it correctly. When we do, when we decide to do something, we have got a, a product management cycle. We know exactly the risk, the training, uh, the way to and to answer in a professional manner to the need of the customer. If you don't do this, if you say, mm, I try, and then I stop after several months and sorry, customer, but uh, no, I won't continue to do this. It's not acceptable and you will kill your reputation. So it must be sure that when you do something, you do, you do it in a professional manner until the end. So we have to answer the question, we have decided not to, to do software or to sell software. Nevertheless, we are uh, we are doing cloud for uh, accounting companies, salary companies, and lots of developers which don't have the cloud capacity to put their product in SaaS. But we help them. But we do our part, and they do our job, their job, and we don't mix. And we've got a frontier where we know each other, but we are not going to do their job, and they are not going to do our job. Okay, thank you. And the other thing is you touch a little bit upon it is also partnering with other providers, service providers, other companies. Um, is it that how did you approach that uh, that issue? Did you always go alone directly to the customer, or was there eventually a moment, or still is a moment, where you say, okay, we have partner companies? which are, I don't know, shall I say, they are a little bit uh, synergy with us, more or less. As you say, they are offering this and we are offering that, but they are, have the customer relationship for the moment and they cannot offer this, what we are offering. So we, we, we are partnering for the customer, not that you are partnering uh, in the co uh, commercial way or so, or, but that you say, okay, uh, we prefer to go directly. Uh, the question is, would you say, I prefer to go directly to the client or, okay, uh, I prefer the channel the partner model. Which one, uh, or did you try uh, one or the other and have, have some feedback? I have tried several, several ways. The, the, uh, the partnership is really important, but it must be something that is really, uh, fixed and concrete for the customer. I give you a, an idea of, of today. You know that Luxembourg is regulated by CSSF, Com Commission de Surveillance Secteur Financier. So all the finance people have to work with uh, uh, selected companies. So when a finance company, even a small finance company, is coming here on the market to try to make an IT infrastructure, they have to, th to think about three things the infrastructure itself, the cyber security, because they will be audited, and the compliance. They have to fix, to, to comply to the rules that the BCE, Banque Centrale de l'État, has created for the Europe. And we, as a provider, we can't give the correct answer on these three levels. So we can say, here is the infrastructure, we've got our sister company can do cyber security, but we need to find also a compliance company which will help you to say that what we have created fits the needs of the company and will comply to the rules. And exactly, we can't be the spoke, we can't be the single point of contact, it's impossible. We don't have the, the capacity uh, uh, to answer correctly to the specificity uh, and the needs of the customer. So yes, we need in, in French, in Belgium, we say l'union fait la force, you know, and it's very important to say that if you don't have a relationship, a correct relationship with other professionals which are doing professional work, 
then you will not be able to satisfy customers. And in this way, we can we can do it. Thank you. And on the if you go a little bit back in the early days. Uh, and was it difficult for you as a very small service provider to get the trust of the client? Uh, then saying, okay, no, I prefer, sorry, but I prefer to work with a name because I can cover my back uh, with that via my heart, uh, management and so on. Was that an obstacle or uh, was the word of mouth so strong that this obstacle was not nearly not present? It's it's very funny the story. You know that we have two companies, Aircare and Aircube. Aircare is doing small and medium business. Aircube is doing finance business. We created Aircare in two thousand one. We created ten years after Aircube. So like this, we had two companies with two different businesses. With the first one, as I said, it was a question of reputation. And the fact that I was helping customers, they were they were my sales, they were doing my sales job. And as I already already told you, my first seven hundred customers without any sale, we did we we acquired seven hundred customers in Luxembourg without any sales, and we did a good good job. And then we were we had finance companies, and we say if we don't do a a finance company dedicated for this business, we are going to lose this, this, this customers. So what did we do? Hmm, fantastic. We create a company. We make all the relationship with the CSSF. Fantastic. We are going to have exactly the same. It means that we are going to receive the business due to our reputation. Mm -mm. It, it happened what you said. And the fact is we could not obtain any financial because the financial is looking more the risk than a small and medium business company non-finance. They are looking at the fact and the others is looking at the reputation and the risk. So we had lots and lots of issues to launch this company. It took us nearly six years to get this company, you know, profitable. And very strange, depending on the community of your customers, then hmm, you have to, to have a success with this company. We had to buy Systemat at the end, which had a, a huge uh, portfolio of customers and then okay we were on the market we had a sufficient size to say yes we can work in a competitive manner and a practical manner for financial sector but yeah it took us seven or, or eight years uh, and the other it took us yes nearly zero at d1 we had uh, we had customers yes very strange two different markets two different ways of uh, looking at the risk Thank you. And on the other hand, you also touch upon that how you evolved, that you uh, were more or less on your own, and then you grew a little bit bigger, of course, with the clients, with the customers, with their needs, with the expectation. You had to get some resources in, I mean, human resources and so on. Um, how did you deal about that? Was that an easy thing, or would you say, oh, okay, it was, it was necessary evil? To employ people, I would say not. It's a nightmare because it's not like this. But uh, it's a it's a poker game. You you never know when you employ people if they are going to fit your company. And moreover, when I started to to recruit my first employee, it was a a big 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 challenge. I I can give you only one answer. 22 years after, he's part of the uh, actionnaire uh, in the company and he's still working for, for like me, for me and for the company. So I was lucky. Uh, but always the question of employees is not a question of luck. It's also a question of uh, dealing correctly, finding correct people, having correct values, sharing your values with your people, trying to put them in the boat and uh, you are not in the front of the boat alone. Uh, no, it's a boat. We are sharing the, 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 this. Today, since two, two years, we have decided in 15 years, I will stop my company. I will stop working for my company. I will be too old. What are I going to do with my company? It's quite easy for the moment. All the IT people want to buy IT companies. So uh, 
it's not a question of markets. The question is, if you want to sell, they are going to kill your admin company. You are, they are going to kill your admin team and so on. And never say never, but I would be strange to sell a company with employees that I'm working with, uh, with for, for, for the last 20 years. It's impossible for me. So what we have done is actionaria participative. So participative acquisition. So my employees are, are buying the company. And I hope that in this environment, we will find the next CEO uh, of Ercare who will say, okay, jean I'm ready to replace you. And you can, you can go and, and do a, your third life. Uh, I, I'm, I will continue Ercare. And this is the really hope of this is also the question of the transfer of this. It's fantastic to start. It's fantastic to run, but it's also fantastic to continue. The, the company doesn't, is not on me only is a company of of people and these people should continue to work yes in the same environment and the, with the same values as uh, i'm pushing for the last 20 years great thank you just a reminder to those who are watch uh joining us live you can ask your questions comments or suggestions in the q a section or in the chat as you like but we, I will get a little bit deeper with Jean-Guy. This means, Jean-Guy, uh, the thing you are touching upon is, okay, we had the start, and then we have then the ongoing life ev evolution of the company. And then it's seldom, as you uh, also uh, mentioned, that someone who starts a company, that they are looking to how the company will evolve in a few years or how eventually it will f uh, finish off i mean positively not <laughs> but closing it down was positively when you started was that on your mind or when you started was just pure enthusiasm and to get things going when you start you don't know if your company will work or not and again you have you have the right to uh, to make an error, you know, for the question of service, question of market. As you said, mentioned before, uh, you are an early adopter of a, of a technique that doesn't fit the market. Uh, a person who was doing EI uh, five years ago, <laughs> today it's fantastic on the market, but uh, if you had to convince someone five years ago, you would never convince them. So yes, to be the correct person, the, the correct place, and at the end, for the question of the, the company, the company is creating a maturity with the time. And you have to think about this. The fact is like a, like a human, you know, you are young, you are starting, then uh, during uh, when you are 17 uh, against your parents, uh, then you start learning and then you start more in the, in the normal way of, of doing or not, depending on who you want to be uh, in your life and and at the end yes you're going to stop working and so on and so on and the company is a little bit like this i think so uh, and the fact is if you want to continue to be young in a company and you don't want to be a, an old-fashioned company you have always to need to have energetic ceos which pushing energy and insufflating new things uh, and changes yes and not a sleeping way of of doing things Thank you. And was it difficult for you to realize to let go a few parts? Because, I mean, in the beginning, one is always doing everything and one is so involved in it and it makes it's a pleasure to do it, to get the hands in. And as you grow uh, <coughs> very often too late, not too late, very often late, you notice that you should have uh, let gone a few things a little bit earlier. Uh, so to have, it would eventually have been smoother with some clients and so on. Was that uh, for you more uh, a relieving part or was it a little more stressful part? Because there are founders who, for them, it's very difficult to let loose and others who see it as a relief because then, as you said, the CEO, 
he, she can then focus on strategy, on driving the business and not on the nitty gritty because he has a good staff who is uh, executing what uh, he, she is devising. So, yes, that, that for me to question is the question of the daily business. So the, the, the question is today is the fact that the, I don't manage anymore the daily business. I manage the future, the finance and the people of my team doing their and executing. But uh, it took me, yes, a long time to do this. Uh, but in terms of shareholders, the question is different in terms of shareholders. When you are working with shareholders for 20 years without any question, without any issue, whatever, uh, you make a drink at home and it will be the, <laughs> the meeting that you want it. Uh, and you must be with new ones, new people, you must be more strict and more, you, you need more explanations, you need more information. They don't know how, how you are working with. Uh, they were your employee before, so there is a, you know, a link between the two, which is a, a hierarchical link. So it's very difficult for them to be, no, no, it's a, without hierarchy, we need to say, I, I agree, I don't agree, I'm okay, I'm not okay, and so on. And when you are building a company with someone you are working with on the day to day for 20 years, something it's really easier to discuss this than with new partners always the question of change we have to change and to adapt that's the yeah. most important and on the other hand you touch a little bit on the shareholding some ventures they need to get external shareholding in i don't know if with you you had external shareholders uh, non not business linked they're not employees or so uh, into your business and if so uh, was it hard for you to adapt as you were saying you need to adapt to the shareholders but to adapt to them because they were either not in the business per se and they were between quotation marks and not negatively providing resources so that you can develop but you need them to uh, report to them in a different way as you would do it with someone. So uh, I don't know with some of your company, or if all of your companies are business, uh, shareholders from the business, or are there one or the other external shareholders? Uh, we had an experience in 2016 when we bought uh, Systemat. Uh, we did uh, an exchange uh, share which we, we changed shares between so they were uh they had a part of her career in fact and we received versus this we received the, their portfolio and it took us two years to admit the fact that we could not work in this and in, in this way so uh, between systemat yes you've got uh, companies uh, founds and all this kind of, of people pushing really pushing hard for the finance results for benefits, uh, for thing, more short-term vision, no long-term vision. For us, it was important to get uh, customers happy, people happy, employees, recreating all the processes, re uh, reinventing the business, which was a little bit killed by years of non, uh, you know, non-strategic vision. But uh, it was important for us. But for them, the question was, "Hey guys, you don't have quick results." Because it took us three years to, to be more uh, to 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 become again a profitable company and so on. So and this is the reason why in 2018 I say, Jens, please we stop. We go to a bank and we buy your 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 shares, but we don't want you uh, anymore. We don't want to work you anymore. But again, it's my 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 opinion. It's my experience, which was negative. But uh, I had lots of different startups where I discuss with and I see that they have really good people pushing being you know the the correct judge giving the correct information giving op opening opportunities and so on so yes at the end the question the, the answers I, I didn't 
I didn't receive a, a very good experience, but I think, yes, there are very clever accelerators of businesses. Okay, thank you. We're coming to the end, so we come a little bit back also to the topic about the user's need, listening to the user's need. Um, we talked about, okay, how you adapt to the market, uh, but the market, we have been more touching upon the tools and services we have, which have evolved. But how have the user's needs evolved over the years? Uh, and would you say was the word, uh, have these changes been abrupt or have they been a little bit long term, or a little bit slower, let's call it slower? How have they evolved? Uh, I can compare first the three countries because we are working for France, Belgium and Luxembourg. Luxembourg is quicker than the other countries. That's for sure. Uh, now we see that the CEOs are closer to their IT environment than 20 years ago. And it's a fact. 20 years ago, they didn't, honestly, they didn't know what they were, what they, are, what they had. Now they really know. And the question is also the third thing which has changed is the conception. Um, you are paying for usage. You are not paying for a software anymore. And then after when you have this usage, you need to have infrastructure and so on, cloud, whatever it needs to, to get it, to get it worked, to make it work. Sorry. But if you, it's a usage, if you are not happy with the software anymore, you stop it and you change which was not the case 20 years ago. So we must be clear on the fact that unsatisfaction is really the key to be replaced very easily. So we must be very clear, clear and, and careful on this subject. Okay. So now in the end, generally, there, there are the two questions. Uh, you touch a little bit upon uh, the outlook, but how do you see the outlook for Air Carré and uh, the evolution a little bit of the user's needs? How do you see them in the, let's say, medium, long term in your, in your area? People want more and more service because they can't work if the IT doesn't work. So we have a long term story again to tell to our customers. That's, that's for sure. Even if they are consuming different ways of, of, of dealing of, of softwares and so on. The, the, the problem that we have is we have less and less IT companies on the market. There is no more uh, Jean-Guy creating their own company, being alone and doing their business. And that's sad because the, the fact is, don't, don't tell me wrong. Uh, it's good not to have competition, but at least you need competition because you can't fix the market alone. That's for first. And second, it means that this IT people doesn't want to take the, the, the doesn't want to launch their own company. And, and I think that's sad. And we, we must have, uh, you know, other national companies, Luxembourgish companies doing their business. And for the moment, if you look at the different companies which are doing the market, they are coming, they have their headquarter in Brussels, Paris, Strasbourg, Berlin, Frankfurt, not more in, in Luxembourg. And, and that's sad for, for our country. And I'm not Luxembourgish, but I've, I've been working in Luxembourg for, for the last 30 years. And it's very important for me that the Luxembourg continues to be independent in their IT strategy. And when you see our data center and the, 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 the risks they have of being, you know, uh, not used anymore. That said, also, so lots of things to do on the IT business. And then the last question, which we generally ask is, uh, what could, I mean, you provided us now a wealth of information and insights and also a, uh, as the aim we have is to educate budding entrepreneurs or ventures to, to show them that it's even if it's hard, it's feasible and it's uh, not 
always reinventing the wheel, but looking what others have done or how they have done to overcome these, <laughs> issues, these issues. And uh, then the, the question is, how could Startup Grind as a network, I mean, international startup kind of, uh, uh, what, what could they assist you in? For example, I don't know if, if it's to get a ticket uh, to an exhibition somewhere in uh, one of the countries or if you're in the US to get a contact to someone. Uh, I mean, I, I don't mean now uh, something very specific, but is there something that the community, the startup grind community could provide you or Erkari? So we are uh, not only myself, we are missing two things, money and people. So money you've got in other countries, tax shelters and all these kind of things. It's very important for me to give the opportunity for a startup to have sufficient capital to, uh, to make his business. Because when we ask for capital in a company, it's not the fact that to stop these people making an access. We've got a CIRLS with one euro. What are you doing with one euro business if you don't have capital to, to make your growth? So, and we've got... Uh, We've, we need people, and Luxembourg has a, has a lack of uh, um, attraction for the moment. And, and so the, this means that we have less and less people which are uh, clever coming and deciding coming from other countries to, to live in Luxembourg because the price is so important to find a, a house. Then it's complicated if you put people outside European Commission, they need to work in to live in Luxembourg or so if they want to work in Luxembourg. So very complicated. If you look at American people, fantastic schools, you, they are ready to come, but uh, it will take 10 months to arrive and after they have to find a house in Luxembourg. And, and again, this competition is against Dublin, uh, Amsterdam, Brussels and Paris. And we have to think this about this in Luxembourg. Great. Thank you very much, Jean-Guy, and thank you, the audience, for having uh, uh, for having joined us. And as I said, this will be available soon on our channel, Startup Grind channel on YouTube. And thank you, Jean-Guy. Thank you also. Have a nice day, all. You too. Bye. Bye.